Coming up on Chopper's Politics... I sort of compared it a little bit to a, to a football match. The fellas of the toys are back in the game. It's a bit like a match where one side's gone 3-0 up, and as a Liverpool fan, you know all about um, comebacks. Uh, and, you know, where, where one, one team thinks it's all over, and then the other team gets a goal back. And all of a sudden, there's a little bit of doubt that creeps into the, uh, the team that, that thinks that they've already won. I'm Christopher Hope. Chopper to my friends, Associate Editor at The Telegraph, and welcome to Chopper's Politics Podcast. Well, it's been a massive and indeed historic week in British politics. We have our first ever British Asian Prime Minister in Rishi Sunak, a fact that has made welcome headlines around the globe. And I was lucky enough to interview Rishi Sunak fairly recently, but more of that a bit later. But first up, it's been a big week for those in charge of the Tory party. And one of Rishi Sunak's first jobs in government was to create a government of all the talents from all wings of the party in his cabinet. So I thought to ask a former Conservative leader to join me on this week's podcast, Sir Ian Duncan-Smith. Sir Ian Duncan-Smith, welcome to Chopper's Politics Podcast. Great to have you on. Chris, very good to be on. Rishi Sunak, is he right wing enough for you? I don't really know what the definitions of right or left really mean in the Conservative Party. What I do look for from him after his pledges are first and foremost that he will complete the process of taking advantage of Brexit, getting the deal on the Northern Ireland Protocol bill through both houses and, if necessary, to use the Parliament Act to drive it through, to get the EU to recognise that this doesn't work and has to be changed or we will do it ourselves. So that's number one. Number two, I think, is to make sure that he produces all the changes to the regulatory processes that we can now do as we left the EU that I reported on in a Tigger report over a year ago, which will hugely boost the UK economy. Tigger stands for what again, Ian? Sorry. Basically, it's about regulatory reform after we've left the European Union, and it deals with all the areas in all the industries. And of course, the second reading of the bill would, yeah. will do that was uh, on Tuesday, wasn't exactly it? Exactly right. And we need to really rocket boost that because it's very important. We promised the advantages of Brexit and one of the biggest advantages to change our regulations so they reflect the way that we work and that gives us great scope to improve the quality and the potency of our financial services, of our manufacturing industries, agriculture industries and even now new industries like MedTech which could be absolutely huge and will be then centred in the UK. Okay, so there's Brexit, there's cutting regulation, red tape. You haven't mentioned taxes yet. Well, because I think the Conservative Party, it is the party of lower tax, or at the end of the day, it's lost its identity. So he's promised that he believes in growth. He also promised that he believes that we will have to achieve growth before the next election, well before the next election. People need to be better off. We've got to get through this period where there's inflation and rising cost of living. But to be honest with you, I think that's mostly peaked now. Looking at the energy costs that are beginning to fall already quite significantly since August, you'll see that actually it may be, and some people are forecasting, that we don't actually see interest rates need to be rising above 4%. And that will hugely help. And therefore, I don't want us to overkill in the coming budget, the baby, as it were, that's just beginning to get ready to grow again. If we're not careful with higher taxes and big, big swathing cuts, in some of the areas, we could actually reduce our possibilities of growth dramatically and head us into deeper recession. And we must avoid deep recession at all costs. Is the A word back austerity? I've heard there may be swinging cuts of 10 to 15 percent across most government departments in this new autumn statement out on November the 17th. There's no reason why you shouldn't reduce the overall cost of departments post COVID. And I think that's there to be done. But I think what wouldn't be right would be to try and bear down on the benefits bill in the way that you simply move them across to earnings as opposed to inflation. That will actually damage them more because they're already well behind inflation. The last increase is three and a half percent behind inflation. And I just don't think it works far better for them to do what I recommended, reform the sickness benefit area to get more people back into work. That's over 1.6 million people are now sitting in that benefit, many of whom I think we did a poll on it, 70 percent want to work. But the system is very badly designed. You need to get them into work and help and assist them to overcome their problems like mental illness, etc., which can be cured. And so all of these things are positive ways to make sure that you actually save money, but at the same time produce more people into the workforce. And as the architect of Universal Credit, you know much more about that that than most of us. So rather than doing a cross-the-board increase by inflation rather than prices, you would do it at targeted increases. Well, the key thing is the whole idea of doing a flat not uh, cost of living, but earnings, 
That would be a mistake in my book uh, because that doesn't do very much. It just reduces their income again. And by the way, the more income you take off that group, the less money goes back into the economy anyway. So you then have a double whammy. The real way to do it is through the reform, as I said, of welfare, which is there to be done, which will give you more people back at work, and that will save much more money than a peculiar semi-freeze on the benefits, which doesn't work, and it disincentivizes people hugely. Just a word on Liz Truss. You were a senior person in her campaign. Do you feel in any sense responsible for what happened? Well, uh, I got her through the campaign. I, I left her two weeks before because I thought there were some things that I didn't wholly agree with, but that's not an excuse. I'm very happy that she got elected. I think the trouble was that when they launched their budget, they did so in a rush, and these things can't be done in a rush. They should have brought together the supply side stuff, the savings that they were going to make all in one package, and had that all of that, if necessary, adjudicated, as it were, or forecast by the OBR or an independent body. Uh, that was the way to do it. For some reason, they wanted to rush the first bit in without the second. Now, that came on top of an already febrile market. So, for example, the Bank of England, even as that was going on, was dumping 80 billion of its own gilts that it had been buying up as a result of the pandemic. They were going back onto the market, reducing, therefore, the price of gilts, which meant the price was falling, which made it very jittery on the markets at the same time. So this was very poor coordination, and the bank does bear some uh, responsibility for that. And so that we could have got through, but there were real issues and problems that came. So I think the right idea, and even Rishi Sunak has said she had the right idea, it was the manner in which it's being done that is the problem. But look, all the gilts are stable now as to where they were on the day of that original mini budget, so it hasn't had any lasting damage. It is crazy right now, though, isn't it, that if you want to cut taxes, you should really vote Labour, because Labour want to cut the base rate to 19p. That's their policy. It's not your party's policy since Jeremy Hunt stepped in. Yeah, and I have to say that uh, sometimes it's worth reminding my colleagues that we don't cut taxes as a giveaway. Tax reduction is an economic benefit. That If you get taxes down, and they're at a 70-year high right now, so this idea that somehow they're too low is rubbish. We've never had them this high, in my living memory anyway. So we've got to get them down. And the reason you get them down is that it helps business invest and it helps people spend their money. And the money they have will then be spent into the economy that boosts jobs, it boosts livelihoods, and it boosts GDP. And so that whole process, if you tax too much, ends and you get an economy, actually interestingly, that goes into recession and the deficit gets worse. So here's the balance for Jeremy Hunt. Be very careful about overtaxing the UK economy, because if you do, you are likely to drive it into deeper recession, and that will lead to a much bigger deficit, which then everyone will be screaming, you've got to fill the black hole, and then you're into a spiral of higher taxes, bigger black holes, and higher taxes. Get out of that spiral. Let's go for growth. Do you think he gets that? He's getting it. <laughs> he individually gets it. I guess. He's getting it. But uh, lots of my colleagues are saying to him, be very careful at this next budget. We are not in the same position we were in 2010. We are not at the beginning of a parliamentary period to give us time to settle these things. And austerity then, I think, went far too far. I resigned, as you recall, because I thought the cuts were too deep. And I don't think we want to repeat that exercise. We've got to get the balance right. The key thing is we must get growth going. Without growth then that black hole gets bigger. If we get growth, that black hole disappears. Do you forecast resignations if he gets this sort of statement wrong? Oh, no, I never forecast anything <laughs> like that. There's a fight this week about Suella Braveman. Why do you think she was reappointed six days after, apparently, technically, but definitely breaching the ministerial code? Well, I'm sure the Prime Minister took the view that he wanted the best person to do that job. There's no question that Suella herself is very dedicated to making sure she gets illegal migration numbers down. And that is the key. I don't believe, for example, the Labour Party saying there's some sort of grubby deal done to keep her on side because she brings a whole lot of people from the other side of the party. From your wing of the party. Well, it's complete sense. nonsense. That doesn't happen. I didn't remember meeting somebody going, oh, right, thank God, that's all right then. So we're all going to be on side now. You know, we are at the end of the day pretty individualistic. The truth is she's there because she will drive the work of the Home Office, which is often dysfunctional, focusing on getting legal immigration down completely. And that, by the way... There's a humanitarian act, because in truth, these boats that are crossing the channel, people are dying because they're so flimsy. We don't want people to die trying to make that risky crossing. So cutting out the idea that you get here safely and stay here illegally, I think, is the way to stop the ghastly trade in, in migrants.
What's your advice to Liz Truss now she finds herself on the back benches unexpectedly? I mean, you also find yourself unexpectedly on the back benches after you were leader in the early part of this century. And, and you've rebuilt yourself. You went to govern. You founded the Centre for Social Justice. You became this champion, really, for campaigning on areas where the Tory party hadn't really been strong in the past. What's your advice to Liz Truss? Well, I always say to politicians, uh, you need to reestablish your core. Who are you? What do you stand for? What do you believe in? Your character is important. I always say to the new guys coming in, there's only one thing you carry in and one thing you can hope to take out with you, and that's your character. The rest is ephemeral. Being a minister is great fun. Being a cabinet minister is a privilege. But at the end of the day, the most important thing is that you look at yourself in the mirror and you say, I'm doing the right thing. I believe in these things and I'm going to see them through. That matters more than any amount of salary you might get for being a Secretary of State. And what's your advice to Liz Truss in particular? So for Liz in that case, it's really getting back to her core when she sits on the benches. She shouldn't constantly intervene and you shouldn't publicly be criticising. But every now and then, you just need to have a little hand on the tiller and give it a push. And every now and then you say to the then Prime Minister or to the government, I don't think you're doing this right. I think you need to go in a different direction. And I think that's the way to do it. And I think to discover what she really wants to do and to make a success of that, it's very early for her. She's got plenty of time to rebuild the image of who she is and what she believes in. Oh, we do a period of calm in politics, Ian Duncan Smith. It's been three months. I've gone grey in the interim. <laughs> I was grey already, so I beat you there. <laughs> I, I think we are due a bit of calm now. I think the markets have calmed down. By the way, the thing that I always get a little bit fussed about with some of the broadcasters like the BBC is that they focus an- narrowly on the UK. They say, oh, the UK has got a run on the pound. The UK has got problems in the bond market. The UK is in difficulty. We are in difficulty. Go and have a look at Germany. Higher inflation, higher interest rates. Go and look at America. Mortgage rates going through the roof. Properties now collapsing in the States. Look at Japan. The yen has been under tax at a 35-year low. Hardly any of that is ever reported. All the developed world is in deep trouble. Yes, I want a period of calm. I'd also like to have some of the broadcasters a little period of reflection about whether or not they've been as informative to the British public as they might well have been in terms of what's going on elsewhere. There's a war in Ukraine and the public understand that having to do all the things we do costs money and does create difficulties. But I think they're sensible. And I just hope the broadcasters will get back to square one and say, here's the problem we all face and we're all trying to deal with it at the same time. Well, Ian Duncan Smith, former Conservative leader, thank you for joining us this week again on Trouble's Politics Podcast. Thank you. Very good, Chris. Thanks. Now, do stay with us, listeners. Coming up, an interview with the new Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, right after this. Right now, the whole world is watching China. It's the 20th Party Congress, a -a twice-in-a-decade political set-piece that reveals the outcome of China's very secretive leadership selection. And there is, of course, only one man in the running, Xi Jinping. This is seismic. After the death of Chairman Mao Zedong, there has been a two-term limit on Chinese leaders. No more. Xi is on the cusp of effectively becoming ruler for life. Understanding him has never been more important. They turned this place into a hell. We're in Beijing, we, we see business people got disappear by the day all the time. I mean, everything is protected and you're under constant watch. But reporting on Xi? Well, that might be my toughest assignment yet. I've come into a bathroom now to try to upload all these files in case on my way out I get stopped and searched and they try to delete these. Despite 10 years in power, he remains a puzzle. One we know very little about beyond official propaganda. Who is he, really? How has he managed to build a cult of personality? What kind of a leader has this made him? And what does that mean for all of us? China under Xi doesn't like these sorts of questions. Don't touch me! Don't touch me! But I'm going to try and ask them anyway. I'm Sophia Yan, and this is How to Become a Dictator from The Telegraph. And we're back. Now, I'm sorry, listeners, it's not quite a new interview with Rishi Sunak. 
Back in August, when most of you were probably on holiday, I interviewed Mr. Sunak when he was likely to lose the Tory leadership to Liz Truss. She was miles ahead in the polls of Tory members. But as we know, Liz Truss imploded. And now Rishi Sunak is back in number 10 Downing Street, probably before he thought he'd ever be so. So we thought we'd go back to analyse what he had to say and find out what it might tell us about what a Sunak government has in store for all of us. And with me as I head down into the Chopper's Politics podcast vault is Gordon Rayner rattling his keys as we seek out the interview that really no one cared about much in August but suddenly is much more relevant. Now, back in August, I interviewed Richie Sunak about his plans to be Prime Minister and Tory leader. Gordon, welcome back to Chopper's Politics. Great to have you on. Thanks, Chris. We're going to go through some quick clips about what he had to say. Here's the first one. Look, I, I think... I think the overriding challenge for the next prime minister is dealing with inflation and the cost of living. It's something that I've consistently said for for a long time. And the numbers that we just had yesterday and over the course of this campaign confirm that that's right. So I think you need to have a plan, and I have a plan, that is the right one to get a grip of inflation and not make it worse, put fuel on the fire, to help people, particularly the most vulnerable, with their bills over the winter period. And I've set out a, a plan to do that, which I think is, again, the right plan. And then moving on a bit to your to your other point, longer term, that of course, there's, there's lots of things I want to do with the country. I've got a vision where I want to make this one of the most dynamic economies anywhere in the world, built on innovation, built on investment. And I think my experience, particularly in business, performing in politics, makes me uniquely placed to deliver on that. Then I want to make sure that our public services are yeah. also reformed. And I've been talking about a lot about the NHS on this campaign. Yeah. But look, d- day one, week one, We've got to tackle the cost of living. We've got to get a grip yeah. of inflation. Because if we make the wrong decisions then as a party, I don't think the country will forgive us uh, and people will have a really tough time. So we need to get that right. Uh, and the other overriding thing that kind of flows through all those periods is about just restoring trust in politics mm. and making sure that people you know, do have trust in their politicians and in government. So that was Sunak there about the cost of living crisis and how prescient Gordon Wayne was it for him to say, if we get these choices wrong on inflation, the country won't forgive us. Yeah, and he wasn't just talking about the cost of living. He covered an awful lot of ground in that clip there, Chris. He was talking about the NHS. He was talking about trust in politics as as well. We'll come to that. Yeah, I think the most important thing to say perhaps is that as we're recording this, they've announced that the autumn statement's going to be put back to November the 17th, was meant to be October the 31st. Clearly, they are hoping that the bond markets will carry on recovering. It'll uh, give them a bit more headroom before they have to make those decisions and those statements about where they're going with the budget, with the economy. I mean, he said during the campaign that Liz Truss was engaging in fairy tale politics. He said it again at Prime Minister's Questions. Uh, his first Prime Minister's Questions used that exact same phrase, although directed at Labour. And an awful lot of what he said has proved to be true. In particular, he sort of looked Liz Truss in the eye during that leadership campaign and said, if you go ahead with these policies, uh, you know, mortgage rates are going to go up to 7%. You know, we're already seeing that happening now, or we have been seeing that happening. So he has every right to say, I told you so. And we'll now see what would have happened had he become leader before Liz Truss, because he's effectively tried to just erase the the Truss premiership from the record books over the last day or so uh, with uh, his cabinet appointments and, um, and his policies. And he said that, didn't he, about helping the most vulnerable with their bills over the winter period. Around that time, Liz Truss was saying, I don't do handouts. Mm. Now, what Liz Truss did do when she came in was do a massive handout, Mm. costing maybe £200 Since then, Jeremy Hunt has paired it back to just next April. That's a £2,500 average bill cap for households. It strikes me, we're seeing a bit there, but that that he's quite a, a targeted support guy, isn't he? Rishi Sunak. Yeah, I mean, look, as he will never tire of reminding people, he was the guy behind the furlough scheme and eat out to help out. He can go back on his track record. He can quite rightly say, I've been the one who's given people money when they needed it. However, the difference between him and Liz Truss was that he always made clear when he did the furlough scheme and and also now, that these things do have to be paid for. He was very upfront about the furlough scheme being something which was giving money now, but we will have to take it back later. And that is what he is now attempting to do. Liz Truss, of course, wanted to do it on the never-never. She wanted to just keep borrowing money to pay for tax cuts. And we all saw what the result of of that policy was. Right, right. You talked there about reforming our public services. Now, Mm. 
That's interesting. I think the, now we have the autumn statement. It was going to be some kind of analysis of the economy by the OBR. Now it's a much bigger thing, yeah. which suggests spending cuts for departments and reform. I think the word reform is something we'll hear a lot of, won't we, going to that date yeah. now, November the 17th? Well, of course, it's the thing that we didn't really hear from Liz Truss, and that was part of what spooked the markets in the first place, that she, Truss wanted to cut taxes, but didn't want to explain how she was going to reform public services, cut spending. Sunak knows that you do have to do that. Well, especially if you're going to fund mm. a black hole in the economy, which is what he's now dealing with. And if you look, look at the reshuffle, now he's got Steve Barclay in at health. Yeah. Now, Barclay's a former uh, chief secretary to the Treasury. He knows yeah. about trying to find savings uh, from departments. He knows what mm. he was a former health secretary, wasn't he? He's mm. well known in Whitehall as being quite a good details man. Difficult. So I think the interesting thing in the NHS is going to be that one of the things which Liz Truss did, which I think was quite largely welcomed, and pe- people have sort of maybe forgotten about it a little bit because of everything else that's happened, was this idea that if they diverted money into care homes, they could clear the backlog in hospitals by getting bed blockers, to use a, a you know a slightly pejorative phrase, but you know what, people know what that means, to get people who, who are fit to be released from hospital out into care homes or the community with the right support, and you then unblock that end of the tunnel, as it were, and that means that you get the through hospitals all the way back to the ambulances that are waiting outside, and we know all about that. So that seemed like a plan that could have worked. Now, we don't know whether he is going to carry on with that idea. The main problem with it is that, obviously, trust reversed the national insurance rise, which was Rishi's idea. That was where this extra money was coming That's from. That's an £18 billion pound hole, which wasn't there when he was yeah. running for leader. Back well, in exactly. So, so he's now got less money going into the NHS and social care. So how is he going to tackle that? Is he going to come out and say, I'm going to spend less money on the NHS? I very much doubt it. Nobody ever says that. But a mention of Britain being one of the most dynamic economies anywhere in the world, built on innovation and investment. I mean, that's the growth message which Trust was pushing. Yes, it is. But he also used the phrase longer term when he was talking about that, which I think is really important because there's a huge debate about whether Liz Truss was more of a Thatcherite or whether Sunak is more of a Thatcherite. And Sunak supporters say that he is the true Thatcherite because Thatcherism meant uh, shoring up the economy before you start doing tax cuts. And Truss was accused of doing the tax cuts before she'd shored up the economy. I think the problem he's going to have is that it's going to take him all of his two years before the next election, assuming this government lasts that long, to try and repair the finances. And then he can't really do much about growth under his policies until he's sorted that out. So I think growth is something which, as he said himself, is one for the longer term. And just one final question there. He talked about restoring trust in politics. Mm. That's fascinating, isn't it? Now, that's what you say when you're running for leader and then yeah. you become prime minister and you appoint a home secretary who lost her job yeah. six days earlier for... Yeah a breach, albeit a technical one, of the ministerial code in Sir mm. Braveman. How is that restoring trust in politics, Gordon Rayner? Well, I'm not an MP, uh, Chris. But <laughs> I would vote for you, Gordon. <laughs> <laughs> he did say it again, though, didn't he? I mean, he said it in your interview, but he said it again outside Downing Street when he uh, made his first speech as Prime Minister. His argument, and it's a slightly narrow one, is that she resigned, that she was right to resign, that she apologised, and that that is the accountability bit and that it's up to him to decide whether that's enough. He's decided that that was enough, and I think what he's hoping is that the sort of maelstrom of everything else that's going on will very quickly mean that people kind of forget about this slightly technical issue over Suella Braverman's it's also, resignation. Is it not also raw politics? It's a fight he wants to have. He's showing to the right of the party, who don't trust him on tax and spend in Northern Ireland and protocol and the rest, that he yeah. will defend one of their own against incoming from the left. I, I think what it's shown is how important Suella Braverman is to him because she is the queen of the right at yeah. the moment. She's the sort of new Pretty Patel figure. Really. Right. She's even Home Secretary, as Pretty Patel was. So she is the woman who can prove to the, the ERG... Uh, and the right wing of the party, that he is taking them seriously. He's also not that far apart from her on immigration. You know, he has talked in the past about how the the way to, to growth is to have skilled British workers, not lots of immigrant workers. And she's obviously all about that. So she is the woman who can who can really sort of go into bat on that topic, take the heat away from him. And quite frankly, she's going to be very exposed in that. Uh, but she's someone who is prepared to really go for that and she'll do whatever it takes. Now, in the interview, we talked about these remarks he made to the Tunbridge Wells Conservative Association when he talked about the idea of levelling up 
in parts of Kent and the south of England as much as the north. Now, that's an attack line which Keir Starmer used uh, on Wednesday this week in Prime Minister's Questions. But uh, Sunak doubled down. Let's hear what you had to say. Where was I when I said that? You know what? I was in... I was in no, well, I was in Kent. I was talking to members across to Kent. Yeah. And do you know where some of them were from? Thanet. Mm. Right? Right? Thanet is one of the most yeah. de- uh, deprived places in the country, according to multiple different measures. So the idea that you can't talk about levelling up in a place like Kent is yeah. wrong. Mm. Where was I a few days later? The Isle of Wight. Where as a minister, mm. I was working with the people on the island to address some of the particular mm. needs they had. And look, where am I now? I'm up near places like Darlington. That is not a big urban city. Mm. They're different. They're smaller. And the point I was making is that levelling up is for everyone. So there are needs that need addressing in islands like the Isle of Wight, in rural areas, in places like Banner, in coastal communities, in places like Darlington and Teesside. It's wrong to say that the only places where these kinds of things are necessary is big cities. Now, that was the mentality exactly. in the past. Yeah. Right? That was the Labour mentality, and it's wrong. And that's why we're winning in all these yeah. other places that have felt neglected for too long. So for me, levelling up is about everywhere. And everywhere has different needs. That's the point I was making, which is why I haven't walked back those comments. I'm like doubling yeah. down on what I believe. Richard Sunak there, doubling down on why levelling up in the South matters. Do you think it's an attack line that worked for Labour this week? It was certainly one of their their key attack lines. And uh, inevitably, they were going to go for him over this video, which I think is one of the most difficult things for him to defend out of anything that they've thrown at him uh, since he's become Prime Minister. I think he made a very good fist of defending it on your uh, podcast there, a point that he didn't really have time to go into in the Commons. The idea that, okay, he was in Tunbridge Wells, but he was talking to people from places like Thanet. Um, Now, whether that's true or not, I don't know, because I wasn't standing in that garden when he made those comments. But I think the broader point is, and and this is really important, is that levelling up was something which Liz Truss seemed to have slightly forgotten about or slightly abandoned. She didn't make it one of her priorities. And levelling up is something which um, Boris Johnson did an awful lot of work to get across to people, i.e. I think people over the course of the Johnson premiership came to understand what levelling up meant, or at least they thought they did. And it was very popular. And I think if the Tories have any chance at all of winning the next election, they need to be able to make good on those levelling up promises. And the two words that that are most important in all of this, of course, are Michael Gove, because he's appointed Gove as levelling up secretary back to his old job. Gove is, you know, for all his faults, um, you won't find many people who would deny the fact that he's one of the most, if not the most, effective ministers in government. He gets stuff done. Um, You know, he, he holds feet to the fire. Uh, he's very organised. And he has been given that job because Rishi Sunak realises that uh, in order to try and retain the red wall seats and indeed some blue wall seats, uh, they are going to need to show that they have levelled up. They, be, they need to be able to point to things that they've done, jobs that they've created, you know, infrastructure that they've built. And it's going to be difficult. Uh, a lot of these projects have gone up in price because of inflation. But, you know, Gove's The best chance of levelling up is to bring back the architect of the, of the idea. Exactly. And that's and what's happened. Gove is the guy who, will, who he thinks will be able to force well, it. Let's step back and imagine around that cabinet table... Swella Braverman, the person who said that Michael Gove was doing a coup mm. against Liz Truss this month as Home Secretary. Michael Gove over the table in the cabinet saying, hello, Swella, I'm still here. Well, <laughs> we, we know and we haven't, we've known for quite some time now, as we've seen over the course of this year, that the, the Tory party is very fragmented, uh, that they are very factional. Uh, a lot of them don't really like each other. Um, <laughs> and they and so we've known and they've known that if they have any chance of of being able to carry on governing, they're going to have to, yeah. you know, kiss and make up. And I'm afraid that includes Gove and it includes Suella. Now, Gordon, we went on to discuss his wealth, which some in Labour think is a, is a chance to beat him up ahead of the next election. But he came up with an interesting way of defending it, which I think we should listen to now. You know, for my parents, education was everything. Mm. And, and that's why, I'm, you know, I've always been made of the school I went to and everything. Like, I, I'm so proud of mm. what my parents did for me. I'm never going to apologise for mm. it. Like, for them working hard, working extra jobs and using all of that and going without for things themselves uh, was so that they could provide an amazing education for their three children because they thought that was the best way to make sure their kids had a better life than they did. 
So he's saying there, look at my values, isn't he? Not at my wallet. I'm looking here at the fees for Winchester College, where he went to school. I think it's £15,000 a term for a boarder. That's um, a cool forty-five grand a year, Gordon Rayner. I know that's a snip to you, given your, your enormous <laughs> wallet. But for ordinary people, that's a lot of money. Um, does it work, do you think, for him to say, look, look, look at my values, look at how hard I've worked, my parents worked, and forget about what's in my wallet? It's a very British thing, isn't it? This idea that if you do well and and you're wealthy, then you should somehow be barred from either high office or you should somehow be hated for it. Um, if we're in America, we wouldn't be having this conversation. They would just be praising the fact that he was a, a guy who had done very well. Also, bear in mind, he, he married somebody very wealthy. Uh, he wasn't born hugely Shutter wealthy. Murthy, Murthy. Yeah, he wasn't born hugely wealthy. I think if you wind back to when he was a child, you know, he, he's he was of migrant stock. Uh, his parents worked incredibly hard, no denying that. They followed what for particularly for my for, for immigrants is the sort of immigrant dream that you come to Britain, you work hard, you put your money into your children, you educate them, uh, and they have a better life than you did. One of, I think, his best moments in that summer leadership campaign was when he was asked about this at a Hustings. He said, I- I'm not going to apologise for what my parents did for me. You must be joking. And he mm. said it in a very yeah. sort of quite aggressively defensive way. I think I think a lot of people really respected that. His parents worked hard to send him to a good school in order that he would do well. He has done well, and now people are trying to knock him for it. And, well... Is that fair? It's, it, it, let's used wait to be, and see. It used to be called the politics of envy, didn't it? It might be weaponized ahead of the election, but let's see. So we literally discussed his heritage in the next question when I said to him, does he think the Tories are racist? This is what we had to say. I'm literally living proof that not just our party is not like that, but our country is not like that. Uh, mm. It's one of the most extraordinary, wonderful things about our country that someone like me with my story, my family's story, could even be sitting here having this conversation with you. Mm. And it is a big moment, isn't it, to have a British Asian prime minister? Yeah, I think it was fascinating watching um, his first prime minister's questions because I think you could see that Labour haven't quite worked out yet how they're going to deal with him because the the very first question he had was from a Labour MP who praised him for the fact that he was the first British Asian Prime Minister and and talked about how his own constituents, the Labour MP's constituents, would be incredibly proud of of what Rishi Sunak had done. And then you had Keir Starmer saying it's it's a real moment in our national history. It's what part of what makes us so proud to be British. You know, they're just having to fall over themselves to praise him. So so that's that's quite difficult for them. Labour love to portray themselves as being the you know the inclusive party and the Tories are are the opposite, and it's just not true. Uh, I thought um, Sajid Javid, uh, the former Chancellor, he uh, sent a very spiky tweet out when Annalise Dodds, who used to be the uh, shadow chancellor, was tweeting about the lack of women in the cabinet. She said, can't Rishi Sunak count? Half the population are women, but he's only got, you know, a quarter of the cabinet are women. Uh, Sajid responded by saying, come back to us when you've had the first Jewish prime minister, the first female prime minister, and the first British Asian prime minister. That's unanswerable. Maybe maybe there's your answer. And just finally, Gordon Rayner, and I should say that a link to this podcast will be in the show notes to those who want to hear the full thing again. But I did ask him some personal questions at the end. I asked him a bit of a difficult one um, about his daughters. Let's see what I have to say. We know you've got two daughters, Krishna and Nushka. We know that you crushed one of them on the ice at National History Museum. <laughs> oh, God! <laughs> but, and this, you know, I'm talking as a father of three. I can ask you this. Which one do you prefer? <laughs> you, no, 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 just, no, no, ignore them. Ignore them. No one's talking. Look, look at her. I te- uh, no, you, I and tell me, you and me were talking. We're talking. Me. I tell you, actually, I prefer the dog. There we go. <laughs> She's another girl. And it wasn't my choice. It was their choice to have the dog. Because when I come home after these long times away who's nicest to me yeah. nova 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 our fox red lab okay. which i've got to be honest i was very reluctant to yes have in our family got outvoted by all yes. the other girls in my life and now you love the dog i'm the same. now same. now the person same. who is happiest that i am home Good. um is nova well gordon Wayne, i'll ask you which child you prefer before you uh, answer that question yeah i'm not gonna answer that Come on, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> no, but he, he, his humanity came across then didn't it? i mean he is a yeah. Clearly, a family man, and his yeah. girls are important. The dog, I think, yeah. he's, he's rooted in a way which Boris Johnson wasn't when he started out as prime minister. I th- and we don't less know less about Liz Truss, but certainly, yeah. I think we have got a PM here who is rooted in his family life, and that's very important to him. I, I think what's going to be interesting is to see how much time his family actually spend at Downing Street. His team say that they, they assume that they're all going to move back into Downing Street. He did suggest that in an interview during the summer leadership election. But they did move out in April when he was still chancellor. They moved out because his eldest daughter wanted to be near enough to primary school to be able to walk to school in her last term before she went off to boarding school. And I think it's going to be quite a wrench for them to um, move away from 
the house in Kens- they have a very nice house in Kensington, inevitably. And I think they're probably very happy there. And Downing Street's not really a very nice family home when it comes down to it. It's it's a flat above an office. And I suspect that he will have to somehow manage to spend a bit some of his time away from Downing Street and his family may spend time at home while he's living above the shop. We also know that when he resigned as Chancellor, he spent quite a lot of time chatting to dads in the playground talking about how much he was enjoying being able to do the school run. Yes, I recall how Nick Clegg had the same issue, didn't he? And yeah. He stayed in, he, living in Putney and he was commuting to and fro. It didn't mean he wasn't quite yeah. where he needed to be. It's such an all-encompassing job. You're not, yeah. you're not above the shop. And with um, Rasunax, they lived above number 10 Downing Street, yeah. um, not the more space than number 11. And he actually told me on this, uh, this podcast interview that he thought they'd go back to the number 10 floor flat because they put up some wallpaper there. Not gold yeah. wallpaper, but yeah. some wallpaper. I think he will have to live there. Um, I, th- I think he may have to spend some a bit more time away from his family than, than he would like, perhaps. I mean, look, I don't know. They may move in and be there the whole time, but my suspicion is... Also, bear in mind, it's not going to be a novelty for them living in number 10. They've done it already. So I just wonder if they, they might look at it as a family and say, you know, we'll spend some of the time at the family house and some time in number 10. And just finally, Gordon Rayner, I mean, we have now got a calmer feel around politics. It's less existentially challenged all the time now. I just feel it's going to go into a two-year period now of just policy debates, which is probably what it should be in the first place. We had some evidence to go on when we watched that first Prime Minister's questions on Wednesday. And watching that, the thing that sort of struck me the most was that the Tory party looked as though, en masse, they were sort of relieved that they had somebody in front of them who was sort of competent, confident um, and combative, and who basically bulldozed his way through Keir Starmer's attacks, looked entirely comfortable at the dispatch box. And, you know, I, I sort of compared it a little bit to a, to a football match. That I think the, the Tory, it felt as if the Tories are back in the game. It's a bit like a match where one side's gone... 3 nil up, and as a Liverpool fan, you know all about um, comebacks. Uh, and, you know, where, where one, one team thinks it's all over, and then the other team scores, you know, gets a goal back. And all of a sudden, there's a little bit of doubt that creeps into the uh, the team that, that thinks that they've already won. And it felt a bit like that, albeit that performing well at the dispatch box does not win elections. On that note, Gordon Rayner, our associate editor, thank you so much for joining us this week on Chopper Politics. Thank you. And thank you to all my guests this week, Serene Duncan-Smith and, of course, Gordon Rayner. And, yeah, Rishi Sunak too. Thank you, Prime Minister. Thank you to my producers today, Louisa Wells and Elliot Lampett. And, as ever, I'd be fascinated to hear what you thought about what Gordon had to say and Sir Ian Duncan-Smith had to say. Dear listener, please email us, chopperspolitics at telegraph.co.uk or tweet us, we're at Choppers Podcast. And for daily Westminster insights, please do sign up to my Choppers Politics newsletter. The link for that is in the show notes to this episode. And please do read my weekly Peterborough Diary column out on the website at 7pm online and in Saturday's Daily Telegraph. And of course, as ever, do remember to sign up. And as ever, please do buy a copy of the Daily Telegraph every Saturday. And of course, please do buy a copy of the Daily Telegraph. I know you won't regret it. Until next time, though, cheerio!